morning. How is everyone? Thank you for coming. Um, you know, in the book of Acts in the New Testament, we read, on the first day of the week, the disciples met together. And so today, we do the same thing. We, just as the disciples of Jesus back then, we meet together to worship a great God and Savior. And we need to encourage one another in fellowship together. Isn't that just awesome? No, we're doing the same thing as the disciples were 2,000 plus years ago. Thank you for coming. Thank you for watching those who are online. I'd like to greet all of you today. As you know, uh, the bulletin's in front of you. There's announcements in there, of course. Uh, we'd like you to stay after the service and have donuts and coffee, as always. I do have a couple things I want to announce. You know, we still have our Wednesday night program. Our teaching time for everyone starts at uh, 6.30 and ends around 6.45-ish. Also, I don't know if you've heard, or you might have saw the signs around the church, there's a blood drive January 29th in honor of Brian Buckingham. And you should see this drawing, a little flyer like this. It's, I think it's on the bookcase back there and everything. Um, it's uh, January 29th at 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock. It's at the, uh, um, at the Cambridge Library. Although um, there's, there were 47 uh, slots and there's only eight left. So uh, if you want to give blood and donate blood, uh, please do that. You have to do it online and it's right down there. Um, I can't read it, don't have my glasses on, but it's, it's there. <laughs> so uh, please do that and uh, it's in honor of, um, um, as Brian Buckingham, as you know. Um, uh, also, if people can get online, yeah. they can call Sandy. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. So, if, yeah, if you don't have access to the internet, you can call Sandy and you can give blood. Uh, she can sign you up. Uh, so, do that. Uh, so, act fast, as you, as you know. I, I, I'm surprised to see that number myself. Um, but, um, good, good to know. Um, um, uh, and what other apps do I have? Uh, yep, Sandy. And, and so, you know, you know it's, it's the news of the day. If someone has COVID or had it in the last 14 days, then uh, you're not eligible. So just keep that in mind on the sheet, too. So keep that in mind. Um, so please think about donating. Um, that's all the announcements I have. Uh, let us pray. Again, Lord Jesus, we lift up this church congregation to you. And, and really, Lord, it's just all the people that are watching online and we can uh, fellowship together, Lord Jesus. Lord, as always, I want to focus on you during this time. I want to cast my doubts and my anxiousness and whatever, Lord Jesus, at your feet, Lord Jesus, each day and every minute of every day. Lord, let us lift up this time to you. Let us praise and worship one true God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please take your comments, worship, insert, and follow along as I read the call to worship? If you could please read in the bold print. All glory, honor, and praise be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit the triune God of our salvation. Praise be to the Father. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. Praise be to the Son. All praise to the Son, for in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Praise be to the Holy Spirit. All praise to the Spirit who has sealed us and is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. To the praise of his glory. Based on Ephesians chapter 1. Let's stand together as we worship the Lord in song this morning. <laughs> Thank you. 
Sometimes we believe our doubts. Forgive our unbelief. Lord Jesus, we hear your call to trust you and follow you in your kingdom work. But often we choose the path of self-interest and comfort. Forgive our disobedience. Holy Spirit, you are our great counselor, comforter, and helper. Yet, we ignore your voice and your leading and follow our own way. Forgive our grieving you. Let us bow our heads now for moments of silent confession. Lord, we thank you that we can come before you and, Lord, just be still before you and acknowledge how much we need your forgiveness in our lives, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your cleansing blood. Lord, thank you for this time that we can worship you and remove any distractions in our minds now, Lord, that we focus on, on you, dear Jesus, learning about you and being encouraged in your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let us hear the good news. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Psalms 103, verse 12. Let's stand together again as we worship the name of Jesus and all that he is and he has done for us. What a beautiful name.
Praise God for the name of Jesus. The name that's above every name. The name that brings life. The name that calms our fears. The name that gives us assurance. We have a number of uh, prayer requests and I want to encourage you to notice those on the back of your uh, bulletin. And with, as a church family, always good for us to be praying for one another, remembering these needs. Brian Buckingham he continues his recovery from heart surgery. Maybe coming home tomorrow. Not entirely sure of that, but possible. Doing very well. We have a number of folks in our family here at South who are in a time of grief, have recently lost loved ones, Judy Bennett and her family, recent death of her sister-in-law, and uh, that funeral was just back on uh, the 31st of uh, December. Ed Sweep, Ed's family, and the recent death of Ed's brother and niece due to COVID. And Laverne, Han, the recent death of her brother. Well, as, as you are aware, of, there are many people in our community right now who are sick uh, with the Omicron uh, variant. And just a little bit of a you know public service announcement or church service announcement, I, I guess. You know, I don't know if you saw the piece that was in the uh, Cambridge um, in in the Star um, now. I think it's called the Cambridge Star, but you know what I oh. Sandy Chicago County Star. I think it's the first time that I've read, and this was this past week, it's the first time I've read something specific about the status of our uh, hospital. And um, the, so this coming out saying that the COVID-19 pandemic situation in Sandy County currently has its local medical center um, overwhelmed. Um, patient care Director of Patient Care, Lori Weaver, said Cambridge Medical Center's census or number of patients was the highest it has ever been in the history of the hospital. It is currently short-staffed by 15 nursing physicians. She said the other thing that was just so disheartening is that people's attitudes, people are so short and mean. And with the fuller than usual patient load, those working at the hospital are working harder than they ever worked with longer hours and double shifts. And um, the goes on to say that uh, some of the doctors have been canceling their morning appointments to work in the emergency room. And um, so that means people who have had appointments with them for two months have had to cancel because they are needed over here in the emergency room. It is, there are, and this was asked last week, the, this person said there are 32 patients on average waiting in the ER, so they are slammed. So, I think we are part of a community and we need to care. Now, what can we do individually? Well, we can make sure that we're vaccinated, for one thing. Because if you're vaccinated, fully vaccinated, which means two vaccinations and a booster, that does not mean you will not get COVID, but it very, very likely means that you would not have to go to the ER, you would not have to be hospitalized. If you are sick, obviously, you stay home, whatever the symptoms may be. If you're out in a crowded public place and you don't, you don't have any idea, obviously, what the vaccination status of people is, um, you wear one of these. And now both, you know, the recommendation with the Omicron variant uh, from both the CDC and MDH in Minnesota is that you wear a 90, uh, N95 or, or KN95 mask. It, it, it simply gives you much more uh, protection. And as health officials have said, any mask is better than none. But uh, these offer these offer the best protection, and I just keep Tina and I keep them in the car, and we go in anywhere that's crowded, or the grocery store, or whatever. We, we we have them on. So those are the things we can do. But there's also something that we can do as a church community, as a church body, and that is we can recognize that we are part of our community, and we can be praying for those people. 
We can be praying for those frontline health healthcare workers. We can be praying for those people who are working double shifts. We can be praying for those who are undergoing the stress of being in a crowded emergency room. As well as praying for those who are, those who are ill. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you that once again we are able to be here in this building. We, we missed this opportunity last week. And so we thank you and praise you that we can be back. We do not take this for granted. We know that some of our church family are not here today because of illness. And for those, we would ask in Jesus' name for gifts of healing. You know their needs. We know there are others who are in a time of grief. Members of their families, those they, have, they love, have been taken from them. And there is no replacing those individuals, and, and there is no quickly um, mending the hurt and the pain of loss. But we do pray for your help. And we know, Lord, that you are the God of all comfort. And you are the God who comforts us in our grief, and so I pray for your comfort and, and your peace. I pray, Father, for our community. I pray, Lord, for those who are helping us by serving us in our a hospital, a clinic, and, and um, they are our neighbors, they are our friends, they are part of our community, and we, we pray for them for protection, from illness, for strength, for encouragement. And Lord, that uh, may they be encouraged by knowing that how valued they are appreciate it. And we pray for your, your blessing on them. Lord, this is a difficult time. But Lord, you are faithful in, in all seasons. And this is a time where we lean more upon you, which is a very good thing. We lean into you when our strength is gone. We, we lean into you in times of fear. We lean into you when we are dismayed. And when we do, we discover that the bountiful, never-ending all-sustaining resource that you are for us. And so we thank you for that. Now, Lord, we're about to open your word, and as we do so, we pray that you will cause your word to come alive to us and do your gracious work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 1. We're continuing our, our, our series on your worship folder if there with the outline it may see same message four that's because I was thinking okay last week would be message three but it is message three today because as you know there was no message last week so now that that's perfectly muddy um, we'll go on but we are continuing in, in, in this series uh, gospel shaped relationships we're going to pick up our text in Romans chapter 12 and verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him some, something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but, be, but overcome evil. Now, very briefly, what we saw from our last uh, message, looking at verses 1 through 8, um, and just 
important to realize again, I know I said this before, that there is, there is a pattern, and it's important to understand this pattern, there's a pattern that Paul follows in this book in Romans, and he also does uh, in, in Ephesians and Colossians, in which the, the first half of the book, for Romans, so it's up through chapter 11, the first half of the book is very doctrinal. The first half of the book is, is saying, this is what you believe. This is what God has done this is what makes the gospel good news. So the first half is, this is what you believe. Then the second half in each of those letters, including this one, is, then this is how you live. This is how you live. This is what you believe, and, this, and then this is how you live. So just a brief recap of what we saw last. We, we are who we are because of Christ. We, we are who we are because of Christ, shapes our lives. Who we are, my tongue is twisted here, who we are because of Christ shapes how we live. We get that? That's the whole way Paul lays this letter out. Who we are because of Christ shapes how we live. Because of the gospel, we have a new view of self. We saw that when Paul says, don't think so highly of yourself. But he, on, on the other hand, you, you don't need to denigrate yourself either. Um, because of the gospel, we, we simply have a new view of self. We have a new identity. Because of the gospel, we have a new family, which in the earlier part of this chapter, Paul likened this family to, uh, to a body where every part is working together. But we have a new family. And because of the gospel, we have gifts to help that family. And in our last time, we saw some of those spiritual gifts listed and the point Paul was making that you have gifts. I have gifts, and you have, some of you have gifts that I don't have. And there's a diversity of gifts, and we need all of those together in order for the church to function and for the body to be built up. Now, here's where we're going today. God's loving us is the basis for our loving others. So there, there's a real focus to this text, and that is really about the reality that we are called to love others. And where does that come from? God's loving us is the basis for that. So you hear this kind of expression, for example, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17, where Paul talks about faith, faith working itself through love. Faith working itself out through love. You see, by, by faith, we have received God's love into our lives. We have experienced God's love in, in our lives. And the fact that we have experienced that love by faith in Jesus Christ means that now that's the basis for our loving others. God is not asking us to, to love others just out of some sort of innate goodness or innate feeling of affection that, that we have. God is calling us to love others with the love that he has put into us, which we have received by faith. And then, gospel theology is practical. Well, biblical theology is practical. Gospel theology is practical. Belief changes behavior. If you look at your behavior in your life, if you look at anyone's behavior, good behavior, bad behavior, you should ask the question, what is the belief behind that behavior? Because our behavior is always dictated by, by something that, that we believe. Belief changes behavior. Gospel theology is practical. So if when we focus again and again and again and again, we come back to what God has done through us, through Jesus Christ. That working in us, that belief, changes our behavior. We cannot be left, it will not allow us to be left the same. Now first we want to see the framework of love in, in, in verse 9. And, and the, the framework of love is... Is, is three foundational truths that kind of frame or go around everything else um, that we're seeing. So the, the framework of love. Gospel-formed love is committed to three foundational qualities. The first is sincerity. Sincerity. Love must be sincere. Another translation re uh, renders love, love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Don't fake it. Gospel-formed love is not hypocritical. 
Gospel formed love is, is not pretend. And one of the great tragedies of the church, and you know this if, you, if you've grown up through, through the church, I don't care what, what church it is, there, there is a message that's communicated that you need to love people, you need to love everybody, you may not like them, but, but you need to love them, and, and, and you know, even if, 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 if you don't feel like it, just, just put on a smile, just, just smile at them. Nice plastic smile. <laughs> I love you. Love you. And then you get out in the car and you let it out. You know. <laughs> Sincerity. Love. Love must be sincere. It must be sincere. The second in the framework of love is that gospel formed love is committed to hatred of evil. He said, love must be sincere. Then he says, hate what is evil. Now, we don't usually put those two things together. We, 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 we don't normally think of putting the word love and the word hate uh, so, so closely together. But Paul says, hate what is evil. Literally, literally, you would read that, be horrified by evil. Be horrified by evil. Real love means that sometimes you have to tell the person you love that the direction they are going is wrong. Sometimes you have to tell the person you love that the direction they're going is wrong. It's, it's one of those situations where you, you, you love the person, but you need, you need to hate the evil. You need to hate the evil. And there are situations where you need to tell the person that that the, the behavior that the behavior that they're engaging in is is destructive, and and real love is committed, as as Paul said in Ephesians four, real love is committed to speaking the truth in love. He says that in Ephesians chapter four, speaking the truth in love, speaking the truth, not for the purpose of destroying, tearing down. But speaking the truth in love to deliver from evil. Hatred of evil is, is, is part of that framework of love. Real love is framed by sincerity. It's framed by hatred of evil. And this hatred of evil and expressing that in relationships is not easy. I mean, let's acknowledge it. It's not easy. Especially when our culture feeds us drivel. Like, like these song words, if, if, if loving you is wrong, then I don't want to be right. Or it can't be, right, it, it, it can't be wrong if it feels so right. <laughs> what dribble. But that's what shapes the mind. That, that's what shapes the thinking. That, that's what shapes the understanding of, of many people. And it just subtly, subtly, subtly creeps in. Sincere love is loving enough to say this, this path, this path that you're going on is going to take you to a dangerous place. It's going to take you a dangerous, to a dangerous place. Someone has, said, someone has said, sin will take you to where you do not actually want to go and it will leave you, and it will leave you there longer than you want to stay. So in this framework of love, there is sincerity, and, and, and there is recognizing evil for what it is, and in the framework of love is commitment to the good. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Hate what is evil, but cling to what is good. And another translation reads, hold on to dear life for what is good. In other words, real love is committed to doing good. And that, my friends, is actually a very, very biblical description or, or, or definition of love. You know, in our society, love has such an elastic, stretchy thing to it that, you know, we, we, we use this same word for how much we enjoy pizza. I love pizza, and I love my wife, and I love my country, and I love my dog, and I love playing basketball, and I love God, and I love you. stretching all over. 
very biblical description of love is this. Love is a commitment to the good of the other. Love is a commitment to the good of the other. Does that mean it doesn't have feelings? No, we're emotional beings. Is it, will, will love express itself in emotion? Certainly it will. And we're all wired differently in, in that way. But here's the underlying thing. Love is a commitment to the good of the other. So these three are an essential framework to a, to a lifestyle of love. It's going to be sincere. It's, it, it's, it's, it's going to be not um, tolerant of, of evil and the destruction it can be, that, that it can bring, and it's going to be committed to doing good. Now, God's Word gets even more practical in verses 10 through 21, what love looks like. What, lo what love looks like. This is love putting on its working clothes. Five qualities that we're going to go through. First of all, real love is persistently committed. Real love is persistently committed. First, the first part of verse 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Another translation says, be good friends who, who love deeply. And you see this in the early days of the church. You see this, for example, in, in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, you know, there's that paragraph in Acts 2 from verses 42 through 47 that is a snapshot of the life of the church in its earliest days. Just a snapshot at a point in time of what the community of believers was like. And what do we read in that snapshot? Luke says, they were devoted. They were devoted to the fellowship. They were devoted to prayer. They were devoted to sharing together in worship. But they were devoted to the fellowship. And that was seen in very practical actions. Because later in that paragraph, Luke explains what that meant for them to be devoted to the fellowship meant. If, if anybody saw, if, if people saw someone else within the Christian community in the church who were in need... Some of them were actually selling some of their own possessions and properties in order to provide the funds to care for those who are in need. Now, that's devotion. I got two cars. I see someone in, 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 in desperate need in our church family. I'm thinking, well, I got two cars. I can sacrifice one. I'm going to sell one of my cars to help pay for the, the, the mortgage or pay the medical bills for somebody else. You say, well, that would be really radical. Yeah, it would be. But that's what's that's the kind of thing it says they were they were doing. They were devoted. Real love, real love is persistently committed. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. This also means that gospel shaped love. Gospel shaped love means that you and I say to one another. You and I say to those that we are committed to, you'll never lose my love. You will never lose my love. Now that's a very powerful thing. Don't, and don't, don't, don't fake it. But in a society where, where, where relationships break, I mean they, they, they break like straw snapping in the wind, one of the things I think that it means to be devoted to one another, to be devoted to one another, in, in, in love is to say and affirm, you, you will never lose my love. Second, real love is putting others first. The last part of verse 10, honor, honor one another above yourselves. Honor, honor one another above yourselves. And I like the way Eugene Peterson uh, puts this in, in, in the message translation. He says, practice playing second fiddle. Practice playing second fiddle. I don't know if you know what it really means to play second fiddle. But I played in an orchestra. I played violin in my junior high orchestra. It was the high mark of my musical life. But I played violin in our junior high orchestra. And I played in the second violins. Now, in a real orchestra, the second violins are equally as good and proficient as people who play first violin. But in our junior high orchestra, we were the people that didn't play so well. So our music teacher put us in the second violin. But here's the deal. In the second violin, see, the frustrating thing is, is that you almost never play the melody. You almost never play the melody. 
you just got this little part that's going in between, you know, in the in back notes. You never get to play the melody. So Paul says, honor one another above yourselves. Practice playing second fiddle. Uh, this is this is radically countercultural. This is radically countercultural, where because we live in a culture where we 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 see as one of the great virtues of life is to promote yourself, to put yourself up there, to make yourself number one, to look out for number one. This is radically countercultural. Honor one another above yourselves. Well, we just saw an example of this on uh, on Wednesday night in our Life and Life Bible study, which, okay, side, side note, shameless commercial. If you haven't been involved in our Life and Life adult group, we'd love to have you come. But getting back to this, we saw a great example. So we're looking on last Wednesday night, we're looking at the life of Abraham, and we're in Genesis chapter 13, where there is now a conflict, because Abraham is now very prosperous, and he has a lot of possessions, meaning cattle and herds, and his nephew Lot has a lot of possessions, cattle and herds, and the text says the land could not support them both. And there was conflict between the herdsmen of Abraham and the herdsmen of Lot. And Abraham was bothered by this. It bothered him that there was conflict between he and his, his nephew, his close relative. And so Abraham takes the initiative, Abraham takes the initiative and comes to Lot and he says, please, let there be no conflict between us. Which is really a very gracious thing because you see, Abraham is actually in this situation, he is the patriarch. He has the one who has every right to dictate what, what Lot should do. But he comes to him and he says, please, let there be no conflict between us because we are kinsmen, we are relatives. And then he does this thing. Watch this. He says to Lot, the whole land is before you. You choose. East, west, north, south. You choose where you want to take your herd. And your flock, and I will go elsewhere. That was radically, radically, radically countercultural. What, what the expectation would have been that Abraham would say to his nephew Lot, "You take your flocks, you herds, and your herds. You go down to that gully way over there, miles away, where there's hardly any water, and you can be there, and I'm going to stay here. Every right to do that. What is, what is Abraham doing? Well, he's humbling himself." And he's honoring, he's actually on, he's doing just what Paul's talking about. He's honoring someone else above himself. He values this relationship enough to do this. So he's willing to play second fiddle to his nephew and give him the right of first choice. Unheard of. And one of the things we saw on Wednesday night is what, what gave Abraham the ability to do that? Well, it was the security of knowing that God was his provider. It was the security of knowing that the God who entered into covenant with him was going to take care of him. And by the way, that's the same security that you and I can have to willingly play second fiddle. To willingly say, I'm going to put the interests of others, I'm going to choose to put the interests of others ahead of myself. What gives us that ability? What gives us that second fiddle? Uh, to, to play second fiddle? Just knowing God is our provider. God is the one who's, who's going to be faithful to us. All right, a third quality, a third quality of gospel-shaped love is real, real love. Real love is, um, real love is patient. Real love is patient. And um, before I get to that, I, I missed something that I wanted to c cover under this uh, second uh, point, putting others first that this, this statement, putting others first, actually connects back to verse 16, where Paul says, live in, live in harmony, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be, do not be conceited. And that comes under that umbrella of, of putting others first. Be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. I like the way Eugene Peterson puts it. Make friends, make friends with nobodies. Don't try to be the great somebody. Isn't that good? Make friends with nobodies. Don't try to be the great somebody. How sad. 
How sad would it be if someone was to come into our fellowship or come into our service on a Sunday morning, come down to the fellowship time, and they have really ratty clothes on. And they look kind of disheveled. And maybe they're not exactly wearing cologne, if you get my what I'm saying. And they're treated in such a way that what's communicated to them is, uh, you know, you don't really belong here. You, you, you really don't belong here. You can sit at that table over there. And you don't really belong here. If you're willing to associate with people of low position, that's putting others first. Now, thirdly, re real love is, is patient. Real, real love is patient. And this actually comes out in, in verses 11 and 12. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient, patient in affliction, faithful, faithful in prayer. Real love is, is, is patient. What are these, what's he saying in these things? He's saying that real, real love is steadfast. Real, real love is steadfast. It's, it, it's going to hang, it's going to hang in there. It's not going to, it's, it's not going to drop off. Keep your spiritual fervor. Don't be lacking in your zeal. And, and be joyful and patient. Patient in affliction and, and faithful in prayer. Real love is, is patient. And oh, how there is need in our lives to practice patience. And to realize that people, we want people to be patient with us, right? So we need to be patient with them. Don't give up. Don't give up on your brothers and sisters. Don't give up on your brothers and sisters in Christ because they're not where you are spiritually. And fourth, real love, real love combines feeling with action. Real love combines feeling with, with action. So verse 13, uh, share with God's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Those are actions. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Now those are actually two different things. Okay, you get the share with God's people in need. That's share, like I talked about earlier, like the folks in Jerusalem in, the, in, in, in Acts 2 were committed to helping one another in practical ways. Share with God's people in need. You know a brother and sister has a need, um, physical, material, financial, whatever, Share with that person in need. But the second one is actually different. In, it, it's right behind it. And he says, share with those in need. Practice hospitality. Now you see, the New Testament concept of hospitality, what that word meant in the first century church is very different. When you and I hear the word hospitality, what do we think of? Well, we think about we're going to invite people over, we're going to share a meal with them, you know, primarily our friends, people from the church, whatever, our family. We're going to open up our home, we're going to entertain them, we're going to share together. The word in the New Testament that is, we have in our Bible, hospitality, literally means love of strangers. Hospitality goes beyond just sharing with people in need. Those may be people you know, but hospitality, Hospitality is sharing and helping people you don't know, but you, you open up your door to them. And this was very important in the life of the early church. Because the situation in the life of the early church was, is kind of, was very much similar to what has been happening today in India that Joseph Jenkins talked to us about, where there are believers, there are Christians, who've lost their homes and have been driven out of their village. They've lost everything, been driven out of their village, and believers who live in other areas of the country have taken them in. Strangers, people they don't know, taken them in. Helped them to get, get reestablished. That's, that's hospitality. That's hospitality. So it's, it's, it's not just feeling sympathy, but it's putting action. It, 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 it's putting action behind that. And then you see it even more uh, in, in verse... 15, you know, again, putting feeling, combining feeling with, with action, verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. In other words, real, real love, real love enters into 
real love, real love enters into and seeks to connect with people and what they are going through. And then finally, Paul takes the way of love. Paul takes the way of love to a much, much deeper level. And this is the one that we would struggle with. Real love is extended. Real love is extended in the face of evil. Verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. That, that only comes natural to us, doesn't it? No. Not at all. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And then verse 17, just to highlight a few things. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. That's a natural human tendency. That is a tendency that is played out again and again and again in our world, in, in many parts of the world, including here in our own country. You did something evil to me, I'm going to get you back double. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. And, and here's something. If it is possible, sometimes... You know, you can't change the other person, right? You, you can't change them. You can't dictate their behavior. But what can you do? If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You see how I put that? As far as it depends on you. You're the only person. You, you can only be responsible for you. You can't control what they do. But as far as it depends on you. And then, do not take revenge, my friends. Leave room for God's judgment. God is, going to be, God is the ultimate judge. You don't have the right to judge them. God does. And it is only His justice that is perfect. So don't get into the revenge thing. Leave room for God's judgment. On the contrary, he says, and here again, this is radical. This is countercultural. This is not the way the world works. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Expression burning coals on his head probably means you're doing this may bring conviction to him. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So here we have the Apostle Paul. We have the Apostle Paul saying these kinds of things. If Don't, don't avenge yourself. If your enemy is hungry, uh, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something uh, to drink. Do not repay evil for evil. Well, Paul, where in the world did you get that? I'll show you where he got it. There is no disconnect between the teaching of Jesus and the apostles at all. Everything you read in the epistles, where the apostles, where it's Paul or Peter or John, are, are, are talking to us about how we ought to live, everything that they ever say to us in the epistles is, is built on the foundation of what Jesus said. So Paul is building on the foundation of what Jesus said in, in, in the Sermon on, on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, he said, Blessed are those who are persecuted, not the way the world thinks. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus said something else, and I think Paul is certainly uh, building on this in exactly what he's been sa saying to us. Verse 43, Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now read that and read, and read that right alongside what Paul writes in Romans 12. You see that Paul is building on that foundation. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be, so that you may be seen to be sons of your Father in heaven, because he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Jesus is saying, when you do that, totally countercultural, totally against our selfish human nature, when you choose to show kindness to those who are unkind, when you choose to love and show love to those who are your enemies and who are against you, who are you acting like? You're acting like your father. And when you respond in those ways, you're, you're showing that you are his, his child. So we see five ways. We see five ways in which we can say this is what love looks like. Real love is persistently committed. Real love is putting others first. 
Real love is patient. Real love combines feeling with action. Real love is extended in the face of evil. Now, how, how can we love like this? Only by the gospel. Only by the gospel. So, three things to bring before you about how we love like this. Only by the gospel. The gospel reminds us how patient God is with us. The gospel reminds us how patient God is with us. Back in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, Paul says, don't you, don't you understand that it is the patience and it is the kindness of God that leads, leads you to repentance? Don't you know that if you are saved, don't you know that if you've been born again, don't you know that if you are a child of God, it is because God has been very, very patient with you and has shown you his kindness. The gospel reminds us of how patient God is with us. Secondly, the gospel shows us how we should think about ourselves. How, should, how we should think about ourselves, not conceited, not better than anybody. Tim Keller Pastor Tim Keller writes, Those who understand the gospel cannot possibly look down on anyone since they were saved by sheer grace, not by their perfect doctrine or strong moral character. Those who understand the gospel cannot possibly look down on anyone. It's all Thirdly, the gospel enables us to love when loving seems impossible. And how is it that the gospel enables us to love when loving seems so hard, even impossible? How? By the power of Christ in us. By the power of Christ in us. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I'm alive, I'm walking around, I'm breathing, I live, but it's not I, it's Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. I live by faith in that Son of God, Jesus, who so loved me that he would go to a Roman cross and suffer and bleed and die in order to rescue me. The gospel enables us to love by the power of Christ in us. Father, we thank you that when you make us your own, that when you save us, it's much more than being delivered from hell. It's much more than being given a ticket to hell. We enter into your family. We become citizens of your kingdom. And because of who you are and because of what you have done, we can live a different way. We can live life with a different focus. We can walk in the way of love. Amen. Let's stand together as we close with worshiping the Lord in song. He is mighty to save.
Thank you for being with us via the live stream, and may God bless you. And now may we receive the Lord's benediction. May the love of God that bought us, the love of God that sought us, be the love of God that flows through us. In Jesus' name, amen.